Thank you, David. And congratulations to Disney on its diamond anniversary, too. We also want to thank many of the sponsors today who are highlighted in the program. And our first one, obviously, is Mesa Water District, right in front of me. Thank you very much for being a part of this today as our lunch sponsor. Frank De La Vera, <laughs> Vice President of Environmental Affairs for Disneyland Resort and his staff, especially Debbie Mills. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff Pfeiffer and Marcy Brezerich of the Entertainment Department here at Disneyland Resort. Thank you very much. <laughs> Disney graphic designer, Julie uh, Bertrand, and her wonderful designs. I think everybody would agree. Very, very talented. Thank you. <laughs> Irvine Ranch Water District for sponsoring our program. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and all of our many table sponsors, associate sponsors, and breakfast sponsors, and chamber sponsors. Without you, this event would not be possible. And really, thank you all for being here today. We hope that you do find this informative. We hope you have a good time today. If you have any questions, stop any of us along. And I'm going to turn the phone, microphone back to Ben. Always thank you for being here. Thank you. Pleasure. My mother-in-law was one of the first guests, actually, too, by the way. So she still talks about it. So yeah, this place is magical and, and uh, cascades for many decades. So. Uh, thank you. Before we start, we ask as a courtesy to our speakers and your fellow attendees that everyone please mute your electronic devices, and, uh, and if you get a call, please kindly take it out in the lobby. You don't want to be that guy, right? So, or gal. So in our first session, Necessity is the Mother of Invention, we will view a clip from an insightful short film created back in the 1930s by the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. It was produced to persuade voters to approve constructing the Colorado River Aqueduct. Though the film was made more than 80 years ago, California's thirst for new and sustainable water supplies has not changed. So let's roll the clip. You have just witnessed a tragedy of the desert. This same tragedy has occurred many times in the history of man. The moral to be gained by it must be learned, for we here in Southern California are face to face with a water problem. While lacking the dramatic element is far more serious because it affects the lives and property of every man, woman, and child in this region. All Southern California was at one time a desert waste, such as you see here. We have reclaimed this desert, and now we have in its place this growing empire. But the desert is ever around us, waiting and eager to take back what was once its own. And it will take it back unless we bring in more water. For thousands of years, nature had been accumulating the rainfall in Southern California and storing it underground. Then came the white man, and he began to use this underground water. At that time, there was an artesian well belt in Southern California underlying 315 square miles. As Southern California developed, its water requirements increased, and we were soon using more water than was being replaced by nature. Each year, this overdraft has become larger and larger until now we are forced to pump from depths of 120 to 200 feet. 
And today, we're withdrawing from our reserve supply each day 170 million gallons more water than is being replaced by nature or man. This tremendous overdraft is rapidly exhausting our underground water reserves. And unless we take immediate steps to bring in water from an outside source, the people of Southern California will be up against a serious water shortage. But we're fortunate in having within our reach a water source capable of supplying our needs. This source is the Colorado River. Our problem, therefore, resolves itself into the task of building an aqueduct or water supply line to bring to us the water we so urgently need. This is the task now being carried forward by the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, an organization composed of a number of cities that have joined together to solve this problem. This map shows the Colorado River and the Metropolitan Aqueduct which will bring water to the cities of the Metropolitan Water District. Of course, we're all familiar with this particular spot on the Colorado River. It is here that the United States government is now constructing the Great Hoover or Boulder Dam. 150 miles below the dam, the world's largest water supply system, the Metropolitan Aqueduct will have its intake how to get the water of the Colorado River to the cities of Southern California across vast desert country and mountain ranges has been a mighty problem. 60,000 square miles have been charted and 65 separate routes have been carefully studied during the seven years of research. After these stupendous preparations, the engineers unanimously agree that the best and most economical of all possible routes is the one with its intake at or near Upper Parker Canyon, as shown on this scene. From here, the aqueduct will strike due west, passing over mountains, through tunnels, and across desert country until it delivers the water to the cities of the Metropolitan Water District. This aqueduct will bring to us one billion gallons of water each day. Careful estimates of the cost of the aqueduct reveal the fact that it will be able to deliver water to the coastal cities of Southern California at about the average rate charged by other large cities throughout the United States. This will be a remarkable accomplishment for no other section has water problems half so difficult as Southern California. We must not think that this is something for the future. It is of the most immediate and pressing necessity and reminds me of the lady who went to the bank to have her check cashed. I'm sorry, madam, you haven't sufficient funds to cover this check. Why, I can't understand that. I deposited a thousand dollars in this bank only, uh... Yes, but you've been drawing on that continuously without making any further deposits. Your balance is now 87 cents. 87 cents? And Southern California has been drawing on its water reserves in the very same manner without properly replenishing a rapidly dwindling water supply. We must face the facts for the value of our homes and our business, the security of our jobs, all depend upon an ample water supply. Out here in Southern California, we're building a great empire on the edge of the desert. If we are to survive and to grow, we must have the water that will enable us to maintain our mastery over the desert. Wow. That's some marketing, right? Wow. Use that. 80 years old. Things have changed, but it's amazing how some things are still the same, right? Eerily similar. Necessity is the mother of invention is an English proverb that dates back to the 1500s, meaning that difficult or impossible scenarios prompt inventions aimed at reducing the difficulty. In our first session, we are going to hear how one of the nation's oldest and trusted sources forecasts our weather. Janice Stillman is the editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac based in New Hampshire. New Hampshire's a great surf 
area, Rye Beach, served it many times, wonderful place. Um, Janice is not only the 13th editor of the Almanac's history, but also the first female to hold the title. Since 1792, the Old Farmer's Almanac has been known for its traditionally 80% accurate weather forecast. 80%, wow, could have used that in college. We know, we know there are repeated weather cycles, so why wait for others to solve our water problems? We must be proactive in doing something about it. Our second speaker is Stephen Arakawa, manager of the Bay Delta Initiatives Program at the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. He is a go-to person who is doing something about it. The difficult, or some say the impossible challenge he faces every day is trying to secure a reliable supply from the state water project through environmental and water supply improvements in the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta. A key initiative within the program is completion of a Bay Delta Conservation Plan, which entails the environmental review, permitting, and preliminary design for both environmental restoration of the Delta and an improved water delivery system in the Delta. Please join me in welcoming Bolt to the stage. Thank you and good morning. Thank you for your enthusiasm for the Old Farmer's Almanac and the opportunity to tell you a little bit about its history and the way we make our weather forecasts. The Old Farmer's Almanac is the oldest continuously published periodical in North America. It was started in 1792 by Robert B. Thomas. His picture will come up on the screen and he'll be on the right. Uh, Thomas grew up on a farm in Massachusetts. Just about everybody lived on a farm in those days. Newspapers were few. Almanacs, which have been around since the second century, were the source of news and information. Folks read and depended on the local farmer's almanac for time and money-saving ideas to help them get through the day, as well as information related to the day itself. For example, the sunrise and set, the moon rise and set, public and religious holidays, and other information. Robert B. Thomas's father was a teacher. And because of that, he had a library in his home. Now, we can guess that it may have been a few books. We don't imagine it was a room lined with uh, bookshelves. But nonetheless, he had far more books than most homes. Most people had two books in their homes, a, a farmer's almanac and a Bible. And only one of those took advertising. Robert B. Thomas was a reader. And one of his, famous, excuse me, one of his favorite books was Ferguson's Astronomy which he used as a guide to observe the moon, the constellations, conjunctions, and other sky events. Robert also read the almanacs of his day. Eventually, he found them to be lacking in useful information and generally dull. When he was in his early 20s, he determined to calculate and publish his own farmer's almanac, setting as his, as his mission to be useful with a pleasant degree of humor. He produced an almanac as a calendar of the heavens, one with accurate astronomical predictions, practical information, such as when and how to spread manure. Over the centuries, manure is a huge topic. Uh, farm bookkeeping, a new method of making butter, weather forecasts, recipes, math quizzes, witty observations. He published the New England College Vacation Days so that students could go home and help seed and later harvest. He published Distance Between Places. There were no maps, and people traveled on foot or on horseback. He published Interest Rates, because there were no calculators. And he had all of this on 46 pages. For his first edition in 1792, he printed 3,000 copies and offered it uh, at uh, about six pence. That's about nine cents in today's money. It was for the year 1793, when George Washington was president. And the, the issue sold out. He never looked back, and he was the editor until he was 80 years old, died proofing pages, we're told. That's Robert B. Thomas on the right. There's the cover of the Old Farmer's Almanac with what we call our generic sort of centerpiece. You'll see on the, some of the tables that uh, it always has the year, the actual year, in red digits there. Robert B. Thomas is on the cover on the right. Benjamin Franklin is on the cover on the left. Benjamin Franklin is the father of Almanacs and the founder of Paul Richard's Almanac. Uh, the, these fellows were not contemporaries. They didn't work together, but we honor uh, uh, Robert B. Thomas and Benjamin Franklin both. The picture of George Washington is not photoshopped. It is an actual photo of him holding the old farmer's <laughs> almanac. Of course, he could not tell a lie, but I guess that rule does not apply to me. 
<laughs> Next slide, please. Robert B. Thomas's earliest weather forecasts were brief and poetic. Cool mornings and evenings, rather too cold, cool for bare toes, brisk winds and flying clouds. It's fun, but you have to remember too, he did not use weather proverbs, those fun adages and sayings about, for example, chickens cackle, cats sneeze, cows lie down just before rain. Although you may have noticed that happening in the past couple of days because there is some truth to those weather uh, folklore adages. Robert B. Thomas applied the same methodology in making his forecast that we use today. He used solar science, climatology, and meteorology as we do, but we have better equipment, better data, and better science. He and we believe that our weather is driven by the sun, specifically by changes in the length and intensity of sunspots. You'll see that chart there, that's that little bit of a roll. It's a sunspot spot chart. Sunspots occur in cycles of 11 year, years on average. Also considered our gamma rays and other solar output. The overall change in energy that Earth receives from the sun does not change as much as the weather does. So there's a correlation, but it's not a day-to-day, point-to-point kind of uh, correspondence. In fact, solar output is known as the solar constant, although it's not quite constant, it does vary a bit. Many people believe that the output is amplified in Earth's upper atmosphere. A lot of people don't believe that there is any effect at all on the, uh, the variability in the sun, but we do. And that is in line with the thinking of Robert B. Thomas and every other editor, publisher, and forecaster employed by this almanac in the past 224 years. As the almanac grew, the weather forecast coverage area grew. That's the map you see on the right half of the page. That's the national 16 region map shown in its most current iteration and this was introduced in 1973. Southern California, the region we're in now is region 16, and uh, that corresponds with the forecast that appears in the book. The question everyone asks annually, monthly, daily, is how do we make our forecasts? Keeping in mind, again, the solar science, climatology, and meteorology. We find periods of time when the pattern of solar activity was most similar to what is projected. We call this finding historical analogs. This is the study of prevailing conditions. We then assume that the weather will be the same as it was back then, however not at any one given time. For example, in making the predictions for 2016, which are done and going to the printer in about a month, we will count one year, for example, the historical analog 70%, another historical analog, say 20%, and the third one about 10%. So it's a, it's a calculated prediction. Meteorology, the study of the atmosphere, involves teleconnections. These are patterns in the atmosphere and ocean that persist for weeks to decades and that influence the weather elsewhere. The best known is El Nino, I'm sure you folks are all familiar with that, which represents temperatures in the western and central Pacific and has well-known effects on weather ac across the Americas. That's both north and south, and lately they're also finding this also in Asia. Teleconnections are strongly considered in most long-range forecasts. While we believe that these are important, that is, teleconnections are important, we believe that they are largely caused by the solar cycles. Okay, special challenges to our forecasts. Two mitigating factors have made our forecasts even more challenging in recent years. First, we are currently in a period of very low solar activity, the lowest in 200 years. Unfortunately, weather records, it's those historical analogs, from back then are very limited, so we have to extrapolate the effects of recent low solar activity rather than use precise analogs. I just draw your attention to the chart on the left, 400 years of sunspot observations. The red period labeled Monda minimum doesn't mean it's red because it's hot, only because it was so low. This is the famous little ice age of the 16 and 1700s. It is said that back then, the Thames River in London, England froze and people ice skated on it. 
people walked across a frozen New York harbor. And if you think that's all so far away, they also suggest in records that teams of laden oxen walked across a frozen Rio Grande in those days. Not far from that, in, in terms of the line anyway, you'll see the Dalton minimum. It's the vertical in there. That was the period of crop failure, uh, famine, and social turmoil. The few solar sun spots typically indicate cooler than normal conditions. But by the same token, if you look, again, the same chart where it says uh, modern maximum, 1950 to 2000, cycle 19, which was in the 1950s, had a record 201 sunspots, and records show, we did an article on this actually in 2009, of headlines throughout the 20th century and through the 1950s, there was tremendous fear of the ice caps melting, there was drought, there were severe hurricanes and severe conditions. Again, you've got this waiver. So for actually from the 19, digress for a moment, from the 1900s through the year 2005 or so, there is a wave of cold weather, several decades of warm weather, cold again, warm. That's the cyclical effect. Uh, with regard to the second challenge to making our forecast, global climate change does seem to be real. The reason we say that is because we have had to make our forecasts increasingly warmer than the analogs alone would suggest. That doesn't mean it can't or won't be cold, but rather that the average temperatures are higher than they'd otherwise be when averaged across the whole globe over, over a period of months or longer. And before we leave this, I just want to suggest that while that sunspot chart ends at 2000, Projections for, we are now in cycle 24. It is the lowest, as I mentioned, in 200 years, fewest sunspots. There are some people who suggest that the projections for cycle 25, which will start around 2020, will be feeble. That was the word that was used to describe it, so fewer than even already. Next slide, please. Here you see this past February's temperature departures from the 30-year normals. While nearly every place in the world is a shade of red or yellow, meaning above normal temperatures, the eastern half of the United States had one of its coldest Februarys on record as noted in blue. You'll see that blue appear in a few minutes on our weather forecast map also. I should mention too that uh, normals or averages used in the old Farmer's Almanac and any references I make here, as well as by your local television and radio weather announcers, and by the National Weather Service and virtually every meteorological outfit is based on a 30-year rolling period. Currently that year, that period is 1981 to 2010. That rolls forward 10 years every 10 years, and these averages or normals are adjusted accordingly. Some people think, oh, it was when I was young, or it was, you know, 50 years ago or whatever. Next slide, please. How well do our methods work? Here you see our historical accuracy rate month by month across the 16 regions of the continental US. This is from 1986 to 2014. It's 19 years, it's not 20, I'm sorry. But if you look at the black dotted line, the dark line starts in November, the dot near just below 70. That is an average of all the Novembers through that time period, 1986 to 2014 our accuracy was 69% through all the Novembers and all those are the corresponding charts. Temperature versus last year, precipitation versus normal, precipitation versus last year correspond their averages of every month through that period. As you can see, our forecasts have been correct about two thirds of the time. This is pretty good considering that due to our, publi due to our publication cycle, we make the forecast up to 18 months in advance. For example, I mentioned that the book is due to go to the printer in about a month. The forecasts for 2016 were in development in January, delivered in February, March, and April so they could be uh, copy edited, approved, and laid out. The National Weather Service, on the other hand, which releases its seasonal forecast 15 days in advance of the season that it's referring to, has an accuracy record of about 55%. <laughs> Even though summer and fall are further away when we make our forecast that is next summer is further away than next winter, we seem to do just as well with, 
then as we do in our winter and spring forecasts as suggested here. It's pretty much right through the middle of the two-thirds area. Next slide. Our accuracy rate this past winter. For last winter, 52 of 54 predictions were correct. You will see at the top of the columns, these are variations from normal. Again, that's a 30-year rolling period. And note that map, winter map above the chart. There's that blue area again that you could see in a small way in the global picture. That was our prediction for last year's winter, east of the Rockies. We called it refrigeration, and it was. Uh, just above San Francisco on the chart, the small green area marked mild, wet, slightly north of San Francisco. The rainfall in this area was close to normal, closer to normal than any other place in California. Next slide, please. How we and others did this past winter. You'll see our weather forecast map in the top left. In the middle at the top is the National Weather Service. Top right is one of several minor publications in this genre. They got it wrong. All these sources except this almanac seem to have counted on an El Nino developing and bringing rainier weather to California than occurred. Overall, overall across the entire nation, our accuracy rate was 96.3%, well above our traditional average rate of 80%. Our temperature forecast differed from actual conditions by 0.56 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about a half a degree Fahrenheit. That is, that's the difference between what we predict and what occurred. Next slide, please. This is what you've all been waiting for. The coming decade, precipitation as a percent of normal across the state. Left of the vertical center line of the past 10 years of precipitation, see some high, some low most recently. Right of center line is the forecast for precipitation in the next 10 years. This is the average precipitation departure for the California cities we show on the regional forecast map, region 16 I showed you earlier. Since there is virtually no rain across the state in the summer season, we only show winter November through March. So you see above normal rain, possibly, I say possibly because we will adjust these and review the soul cycles as we go forward, but uh, in 2021 and 22. Okay, next one please. And here's a similar record of temperature departures from normal. Here you see both winter, November through March in blue, and summer, May through September in red. The spike in the middle marks this past winter, California's warmest. And in fact, by many measures, it was the warmest winter ever recorded. We expect temperatures to be much closer to normal in coming winters, but we expect another peak in the next five to 10 years. Summer ten temperatures generally do not vary as much as in winter, but we expect to peak there as well in the next five to 10 years. So the sun is going into hiatus by some estimates of solar scientists, and nobody is really coming out and saying exactly what's going to happen next. As the years go draw closer, we will look at things differently and hope to see an end to the drought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. Amazingly accurate. That's, uh, that's incredible. And now we're going to turn the stage to uh, Stephen uh, Arakawa. Stephen? So af after I watched the movie Thirst, I uh, got so nervous that I decided I need to walk around on this stage because I was feeling the the huge, tremendous responsibility about how we're going to solve all these problems. And uh, it isn't the first time I've watched that, but it certainly uh, gets you to think about uh, the importance of uh, what we're all facing and how do we approach things. And what I'm hoping to talk to you today about and, and reach, to you, uh, reach out to you about is that our region has always collaborated and uh, in innovated on how we deal with these problems. In fact, uh, in many ways, Southern California is a leader in how we manage our supplies in terms of conservation and recycling and groundwater treatment and things like that. So that means we just, we just need to do more. We need to take advantage of the opportunities that we have. And as we saw in the movie Thirst, this region came together because communities 
had a need to grow economically, population was growing, and different communities came together and collaborated because they needed the financial wherewithal to build facilities to move water to Southern California. Uh, the, the local supply had outstripped, uh, the population had outstripped the local supply capability, and they reached out to the Colorado River, but they needed to have the capability to finance such a big project. So 13 uh, communities came together, and that included Anaheim and Santa Ana, came together to figure out a way to financially afford uh, building the Colorado River Aqueduct. And in the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, bringing that, that capability together through the Metropolitan Water District, which was formed in 1928, they were able to finance through a bond measure uh, that passed five to one, uh, the facilities that bring Colorado River water to Southern California. And that was a significant investment for Southern California at that time during the middle of one of the biggest uh, economic depressions uh, of our nation. And as we move forward, we need to continue to adapt. Uh, we've adapted through post-World War II with the growth and economic activity that occurred then. Uh, we've grown through the drought of the 1970s, uh, the drought of the 1980s and 90s, and we will continue to innovate and develop uh, new ways to manage our supplies and to develop supplies. Originally, as I said, 13 um, communities and cities came together. Today, we're a partnership of 26 member agencies all working together. And that's how our supply reliability to this point has been accomplished, is because people have come together to finance facilities, to implement programs, to bring its financial wherewithal to do water management, conservation, and, and those kinds of things. So today, Southern California, trying to weather through this very difficult, very severe drought, uh, has the advantage, uh, more so than other parts of the state, that we have collaborated and we have entered into a partnership to be able to uh, invest and to manage these supplies. So it's been really four, four generations since the 20s how this has occurred. It started with the Colorado River Aqueduct. And then in the 1950s, uh, we had post-World War II growth and the state water project. And in fact, the whole state of California was faced with the need to have a supply. The San Francisco Bay Area is part of the state water project. They receive a significant part of their supply from the state. Uh, areas of Napa County and Solano County, uh, San Joaquin County. So it's not just Southern California that relies on the state water project that was passed by the voters in 1960. It's a very important part of, of, of the state's capability to manage its supplies. But evolving into the further generations, regional storage and transfers, we saw in the late 80s and early 90s the importance of developing storage to take water in wetter years and to store that water and put it away for dry years so that when we're in these kind of extended droughts, we're able to weather through it and draw on that storage. You saw in the movie that uh, you know, there wasn't much left in that bank account, and we're you know, obviously always worried about that, but the fact is the investments we've made to date have allowed us to build up some bank account. And then lastly, but very, uh, very importantly, um, it's how we manage our supply, how we manage the demand, how we manage our local supply, how we clean up our supplies that are contaminated or have high salt content. Uh, that has been a key part of what we've been um, focused on in the 90s and into the 2000s, uh, things that have allowed us to broaden our conservation efforts to not just focusing on indoors and indoor residential, but focused on commercial and industrial businesses and also now landscape, outdoor landscape, is, is probably uh, the most important area to focus on as we move forward because the residential, and the commercial, and industrial has been growing over the last 10 to 20 years. So these, these, these decades of, of, of development and innovation, all because we have 
looked at historical information. We've looked at what do we see as the weather trends. And in California, weather's either dry or wet most of the time. It's usually skewed one way or another. So we've, this is not new, although it, it seems to be becoming more extreme. But in the late 80s and early 90s, the drought that we had during that time period really led us to diversify our supply. That was really a moment where the region and Metropolitan Water District as a board essentially said, we need to do a better job of diversifying our supply and not relying so much on our imported supply during those very severe dry years. So with that policy action, the, the region went from relying on these imported supplies during drier years, like we're in now, or like we were in in 1991, to developing supplies and storing those supplies and managing those supplies so that in the drier years we're less dependent on imported supply and less dependent on the state water project. And we've grown our capability of conservation, uh, our recycled water capability, our ability to store water into surface storage and groundwater. With that uh, policy and the implementation of that policy, um, since the, since the uh, late 80s and early 90s and up and through today, as these programs have developed and evolved, our population has continued to grow from 14, 14 million people in Southern California to 19 million in Southern California. But at the same time, our demand hasn't uh, risen to the same level. And in fact, in many ways, it's stayed level. And that water spigot has continued to uh, provide water to, to people within the region. And, and part of the challenge is, because the spigot has continued, um, in many ways people take water for granted. But we all know, because you're all interested in water, that that's not the case. We need to, uh, we need to always be innovating. So, for example, on conservation, focusing on the indoor uh, residential uh, but expanding that out to other businesses, uh, public agencies, commercial, um, landscape, having the programs working in partnership with all of the agencies, retail and wholesale, to be able to implement these programs in a way that the customers are accessing them, that they're satisfied with them. I told you about storage, putting water away for a, ra uh, for a, dry, for a dry day, not a rainy day, and putting together storage programs, both in Southern California and in other parts of the state, to expand our surface and groundwater storage by over 13 times in the last uh, 20, uh, 20 or so years. Uh, that's been critical to weathering through droughts. But with the current challenges that we have, the Colorado River Aqueduct uh, is faced with low supplies, low runoff on the Colorado River since Going back to the year 2000, we, we've been facing a, a drier period on the Colorado River. And so looking to, to develop programs with other uh, users of Colorado River to manage those supplies. Uh, we've been drawing down our reserves through this drought. So Diamond Valley Lake, one of the larger uh, reservoirs in Southern California that helps drought-proof the region, it is under 50% full right now. So that's a, a challenge. How do we manage the remaining storage that we have in our, in our storage accounts. Third is we need to make sure that we're getting the message across that managing every amount of water, every drop of water is important so that we can be prepared for the future. And lastly, we need to continue to uh, deal with our imported supplies, making sure that the investments that we've made continue to be reliable, or made more reliable. And in the case of the Colorado, for example, investments and agreements have been made and are being made to solidify the reliability of that system. The same is being done or needs to be done on the state water project. The fact is, Southern California has invested billions of dollars in that system. And rather than looking to have that as the solution for our new supplies, we need to have reliability that we can count on from that system for the billions of dollars that we spent. And so how we deal with the Delta issues, the area where the water comes from, from Northern California, is gonna be key to getting that reliability. So the State Water Project is very important because it is 
a baseline supply that helps us with our local supply. It helps us blend with Colorado River water, which is saltier. And being able to blend that allows us to use recycled water. It allows us to recharge our groundwater basins. And, and each of those are very important to Southern California and important to this region here in Orange County. One of the things that has been going on for a number of years is related to the state project. How do we get that reliability on the system so we're not continuing to lose water due to increasing uh, environmental regulation? How do we develop a system that's more capable of protecting the fishery and the environment and at the same time delivering reliable water supplies? And a Bay Delta conservation plan and options for water delivery systems and improvement of habitat in the Delta system for the fisheries has been ongoing since 2006. The state is really ramping up and narrowing down its efforts to uh, put forward the alternatives and plans for how that would be done. And the most recent being the governor's announcement in late April, where he talked about a California water fix dealing with the water delivery system and an eco restore um, program that deals with really aggressively going after restoration. And the message is we need to get started on this. We need to fix the system so that California, north and south, can rely on this system out into the future. We know that today we're in the middle of a very severe drought, but we also know that we're going to likely be facing um, droughts into the future, as we have in the past, but maybe even increasing frequency of dry periods. And in fact, some of the information shows that we could have a 40 to 50 percent chance of a 10-year drought going into the future. And we need to prepare for that. At the same time, we have challenges that we continue to face. We have increasing population, hopefully increasing economic activity, because that's what we want. Uh, but at the same time, we have uh, fishery and, and uh, environmental needs and regulations we have the need to uh, develop and improve and retrofit our infrastructure and how we afford to do that. We have water quality regulations because we're learning more and more about what's needed for public health. And then energy cost. As we try to become cleaner and cleaner with regard to carbon emissions, we know that dr that drives um, the cost up on energy. So how do we deal with all of these challenges into the future? A diverse way of, of approaching the Supply situation is critical for that. So all that takes us back to innovating means uh, looking to all of these sources. It means um, looking to the reliability of the investments we've made, for example, on the Colorado and on the state project, assuring that that reliability can continue into the future. And that helps build for the local supply management that we need, uh, the ability to recycle water and the ability to recharge that recycled water into the groundwater basins, the ability to desalinate water. Uh, it all fits together in terms of an overall water supply strategy for Southern California. So I I'm, um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about that uh, and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you, Steve. So we have a little bit of time for some questions. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, first, we'll start with Janice. Um, the Old Farmer's Almanac is famous for its question of the day. So here's a question for you. Uh, online, there's about one million followers. The Almanac is the oldest continuously published periodical in North America. How do you, two questions. So how do you keep it fresh after 223 years? And uh, how, how do you, why do you think you've been around so long, or the, the thing's been around so long, so successful? Little are on testing. They told me to do it like a rock star. Okay, do it. So, um, really, the survival of the old farmers' almanac certainly is uh, attributed to a certain amount of luck. But we like to think also that it was the mission statement of Robert B. Thomas, and therefore the mission that we continue to fulfill, which is to be useful with a pleasant degree of humor. And mm -hmm. you know, having a job that says just. Be funny, introduce smiles, a little wit and wisdom, really doesn't get any better than that. Um, I, I would like to comment, though, that your one million count is so 20th century. 
We, we currently have uh, 875 friends on Facebook, and I invite all of you folks go, to go to Facebook slash The Old Farmer's Almanac and become another one of those. We are also on Pinterest and Twitter. Uh, we produce and distribute over three million copies of the Old Farmer's Almanac across the United States and Canada. About half a million of those are a dedicated Canadian edition every year. Those are also currently available as e-reader books and for just about any device you can name. You can go to almanac.com or the various other book selling uh, uh, websites and purchase those. Uh, we also have Four million uniques a month on our website, almanac.com, and we have 11 million page views. So folks come for the weather. That is, without question, the most popular topic. They come for the moon phases because gardening and farming traditions have a lot to do with the moon phases as to when you do various things from breeding and slaughtering animals to planting your seeds and harvesting. Um, and they ask questions. We get hundreds of questions, certainly uh, since the first of the year and right on through the whole gardening season, specific questions from folks around the country in Canada and frankly sometimes a lot more frequently from around the world asking questions about uh, their particular garden and we answer personally every single one of them. Wow, very cool. Wow, you rock. That's good. Well done. So the next question is for Steve. Uh, so, Steve, environmentalists have been criticizing the governor's proposal to dramatically scale back wildlife habitat restoration around the Delta, restoring 30,000 acres of wildlife habitat down from an initial 100,000 acres. Brown defeated or defended the revised plan, saying it would accelerate the pace of efforts to revive habitat in the Delta while fixing the state's aging water infrastructure. The director of Sierra Club California said the plan would shortchange the wetlands and wildlife by spending just $300 million instead of the $8 billion that was initially proposed. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, well, I think that the, the, the evolution of, of this plan and the alternatives that are part of this process have, have been an ongoing um, process. And the governor and uh, the state of California is really looking to move something forward. Um, this, these types of options, these types of approaches have been studied for, for many, many years. And I think that it's a fair point about the restoration part. The governor is really narrowing down for the next period of time, five years, what do we want to accomplish? And focusing on that, we know there are areas that make sense to improve the Delta system for the environment, for the fisheries. And part of the criticism leading up to that announcement was the restoration effort was too big. It's too expensive. Uh, we, we can't afford all of that. And in fact, the water bond did not include the restoration in the bond in the end. So the state then had to rethink, all right, how do we get things started? And how do we focus in on the next five years at the same time that we're looking to improve our water delivery system? So it's being put forward as an, op an alternative, and, and in fact, it'll likely be the state's preferred alternative, but I think that it's really geared towards moving things forward. Thank you. So uh, now I'd like to turn it over to the audience. We have a couple of different microphones throughout there. You can kind of see them peppered there. Um, any questions, thoughts? We have a couple minutes left. Don't be shy. While uh, when we're getting our first question, um, uh, actually, I think, yeah, go ahead. So, with regard to the the the, the state water project and the alternatives, um, the state will be putting forward um, uh, recirculated drafts of the documents that have been out in the past. They've been, they were out uh, uh, several months ago for public review. The state's taken all of that into account. So understanding what's in those options when, when those documents come out and understand what it does for reliability. Um, I think uh, we all know that our, our future is going to be uh, how we manage our water. It's not how we create large and new imported water systems. But I think the, the key thing you can, you can do is understand how this will um, meet reliability going into the future 
and how it fits with the rest of our supply, um, with our, the rest of our supply strategies in Southern California. Talking to uh, the people that you deal with in business, the people that you deal with, your local elected officials, and you know we, we know that the process is not done yet. The alternatives need to be selected, but informing them on the need for reliability and the need to um, for improved quality so that we can manage our local supply. I think that's real important. Question over there. Uh, just wondering if you would make a comment on the uh, proposal that was uh, spearheaded by William Shatner to build a pipeline to the distant Northwest. I was just gonna uh, say I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I love uh, Shatner. <laughs> I'm so convinced that's the best idea out there. Uh, I've recently moved to Pacific Northwest and hopped a flight down here for this, and I, I like to think I brought some of that rain with. So we're on the right track there, but feel free to get a little. So I guess given that you're from the Pacific Northwest, I'm sure that you're probably wondering what Southern California would be up to if we were looking to the, oh, yeah. to the Northwest for water supply. I mean, that, that has a lot of history going back to the 60s. Um, I think there were efforts uh, by um, LA County Supervisor Kenneth Hahn uh, back then to, to look to uh, areas uh, on the Columbia for water supply. And um, in fact, they passed local laws prohibiting any kind of discussions on that. And so it's, you know, I don't have a feel for whether it's as, um, as uh, uh, ramped up as uh, North Cal Northern California versus Southern California. But, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say uh, as, we, as we go into the future, I think uh, we continue to look at options. Right now, I think the options that we have uh, available to us, I think can really bring us out uh, 100 years or more um, in managing the supplies that we have. And, you know, in water, I've always learned nothing is ever off the table. Everything gets revisited over and over again, as the Delta has. Unfortunately, in my career, it's been... You know, it's been something that's come up uh, over and over again, and we continue to punt. But uh, now is the time to really grapple with some uh, significant issues on the state project, and being focused on that reliability and the management of our local supply is, I think, what our strategy ought to be. And um, certainly other types of options out into the future are there for us uh, to think about and consider uh, as we go beyond that. So we're just about out of time, um, so uh, I'd like to remind everybody there is a f uh, Farmer's Almanac on the table, and donated by Janice here, thank you very much. And so the pecking order for that is the person with the birthday closest to today's date actually gets the book. So, so there he is. So thank you very much, Janice, for that, and thank you, Stephen, for that. Thank you. Thank you.